we are here to uh, talk with uh, Jean-Vive Castre. She was born in Quebec in 1981. Uh, sometimes inter interdisciplinary, she is mostly known for her work as illustrator and cartoonist. Impatient and lazy, jean Viv never officially studied art. She has made a few books and has had a few exhibitions in such places as Canada, the United States, Europe, Australia, and Japan, and we're so happy to have her in Los Angeles. Please welcome jean Viv Castre. Hello, thanks for coming. Um, and thank you for having me, Skylight Books. I, this is the first time, I mean the first real time that I do this type of presentation, so I hope that it's not gonna be super scattered and confusing. Um, I recently finished, and now it is published, a book called Susceptible, sorry, it's the same title in French, so. Susceptible, it's um, an autobiographical comic book, uh, but I changed the names to be sort of, so as some form of protection for myself and for some of the people involved, but also because I do think that true, real autobiography is kind of impossible, like it's, this thing that as soon as um, you put it down on the page, you don't know if other people are gonna see it the same way that it felt to you when you wrote it, and, or the way that you remember it. And um, so I tried to stick to the truth, but also, I mean, whatever, it became a story, and also I didn't put everything in there, so it's that's also not super factual. Um, but yeah, I guess um, I was really wary of I was really weary, weary of making autobiographical comics because I don't like them all. Um, I like some of them, but others are not that interesting to read. And so I thought and I felt that I should tell other types of stories, but then I kind of felt like I had been beating around the bush for 12 years and always trying to retell this same story under some sort of camouflage or like thinking like oh it's really metaf metaphorical it's not it's not it's not real but now I'm telling the real um, story so I can move on um, and I have also I felt that perhaps the reason why my story was worth telling was because um, I was meeting more and more people who like me grew up with parents who were kind of really open-minded about drugs and I think that's kind of a newer thing, maybe not in California, but it's, <laughs> it's sort of, a, it seemed to me like it was not necessarily something that had been discussed that much, like a lot of people who have um, intense memories from childhood have families that were like really square or really strict, but mine it was different, it was more like not strict enough. Um, yes, so I'm gonna read I mean, I'm going to show you some of the images of the book. Um, I guess I should say that um, I come from Quebec, the French-speaking part of Canada. I mean, the French-speaking province in Canada. Uh, there is a lot of Catholicism there, um, or leftover stuff from Catholicism, and so my mother is the 16th child of a family of 16 children. And my grandmother is still alive. Um, I never knew my mom's father. And my dad is um, from Ontario, an English-speaking Canadian. And so there's this weirdness there where, um, if, even though I identify as Quebecois completely all the way, my dad is makes it so that I'm only really half. But I, he was not around when I was a kid, and so um, that's why I didn't speak English until I was 14. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> this is meant to be the baby. Um, the name of the, this character that is me is Gogler, which um, is the French word for Bobolink, that bird. 
I often think about what is innate and what is acquired. Are our genes ever a valid excuse? I wonder if it is possible for a sadness to be passed from one generation to the other. That's basically the question of the book. Um, I just got back from a trip to France and somebody was like, but you didn't answer. What's the answer? What's innate and what's acquired? And I was like, the whole book is the answer and also there's no answer. Um, this is the character who, his name in my book is Thegdef. In English that means egghead. And he represents my father. And so uh, I tried to draw things, only things that I saw. And so um, to base all my, my, my drawings on memories, like visual memories. So there were parts of the book that the only way that I could display them was, I mean, I could tell the story was to draw what it was like when someone was telling me about it. So my dad here says, believe me, I'm very sorry to have left you that way. This is the character of my mother, which is, um, in, in the book, her name is Amer, feminine version. Um, like Amer, but like the, the, the adjective is, is uh, feminine. And um, that means in French, that means bitter. So she says, your dad wanted to go visit friends of his in Ontario. He told me he trusted me. He knew I could manage it well on my own. When he got back, I told him he, would, he had been right. I didn't need him anymore. <laughs> and then this is the character of um, my mother's best friend. She doesn't really come that many times in the book, but in this part she is there as like the third voice. and. Um, her name in, in French is uh, sourire, which means smile. I remember how you, were, you, I remember how you had no food in the fridge, and your dad would spend all his money on motorcycle parts. Amère had had enough. You were really poor. We manage. So this is after, after the breakup of my parents. At three or four year, years old, I am all very, uh, already very talkative. Amere and I mostly get around on foot. We live near Quebec City, right across the river. When Amere stays up late, she leaves a glass of milk on the kitchen table for me so I can eat my cereal without making a mess. When there's no milk, I eat my cereal with water. Okay, I know that's pretty dumb. But <laughs> it's a little too cute, but um, yeah, I mean, I remember the taste of cereal with water and I, that didn't really mean that my mom would forget to put the, the milk as much as it's just that sometimes we just couldn't afford to buy some so um, golden grams with water was like weird um, lukewarm water gross. I am an early riser one morning I go outside for a second and when I come back the door has been locked I ask a man on the street to help me so anyways, um, as I was making this book, I just didn't want to be too hard on anyone. And because, um, you know, also something else is that my mother had me when she was 19. And so I didn't want to be too brutal because um, I don't think it's easy for anyone to have a kid that young. And when I wrote this, I just have this very vivid memory of like going outside. I was doing these rubbings, like I was just, because I would wake up and be alone and unsupervised a lot. And so I would do these rubbings and take a piece of paper. And then I really wanted to go out on the sidewalk and on the sewer and like just do this rubbing with the paper and the crayon. And so I went out of my house. And this is a story that my mother would tell a lot it was just like, we never locked the door at my house, but then like she would tell this story of how, oh, um, when you, yeah, one time when Julia was a kid, she, uh, <laughs> I, I woke up and I saw that the door was unlocked and I just was like, oh, okay, and she locked the door. And then I didn't know where she was, <laughs> but I was outside. And it took a really long time for me to get back in the house that morning because, I mean, I was just knocking, and I was three and I was just knocking at the door and like, 
I just ask some random old man on the street to come help me open the door. And it's just funny to think that like that was the 80s in Quebec and how like no one would do that now, like have their three-year-old outside <laughs> unsupervised, just ask an old random man on the street to help them open their, the door to their house. <laughs> um, I guess that's the thing, as much as like, it's kind of funny because I, like now it seems like I was neglected maybe, but now I feel like kids are so sheltered and I don't know. Um, I'm really bad at doing, or I was really, really bad at doing technical drawings. Um, I was really lazy about drawing straight lines or drawing like machinery and stuff. And so for this book to make it as realistic as possible, I really forced myself by looking at a lot of pictures, um, like historically accurate pictures of what things look like. And this is the ferry between Quebec City, where I was born, and where I lived for my early childhood. And um, this other town called Lévis, that's across the St. Lawrence River. And so that looks a lot like now. If you took the ferry between Lévis and Quebec City, that's what you'd see if you were in winter time when it's snowing. Um, this is another one of my technical achievements <laughs> via rail train. Um, so yeah, Victoria is another place where I spent part of my childhood. Ted Duff, my father, is living in Victoria, British Columbia. A man buys us train tickets. The trip from Quebec City to Vancouver lasts four days and four nights. After that, we take a ferry to the island. Somewhere in the prairie provinces, my little backpack is stolen. I had all my toys in it. I passed the time drawing instead. We'll spend the summer in Victoria, and then Amer and I are moving to Sherbrooke, where we will study. So Sherbrooke is, I moved a lot as a kid, and Sherbrooke is a town in Quebec in the eastern township. We call it Sherbrooke, but obviously it's Sherbrooke, or something like that for you people. <laughs> This is a memory um, from age four, I think. This is in our Sherbrooke apartment, and um, I thought that there was lightning on the outside. I thought there, the, I mean, there was a there was a really severe rainstorm outside, and I figured that that was the f lightning flash on the corridor wall in the middle of the night. But um, I hear, hurry up. And then I see a naked man running down the hall with a giant pan full of water. Huh? And then the TV <laughs> was on fire. And this is one of those classic moments where your mom, for kind of the rest of your life, reminds you of that time that you said the obvious, which is <laughs> the TV is on fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And that was another thing about drawing childhood and changing names and everything, I am super hyper aware that it's so intense to draw these people naked. <laughs> but that's the thing about being a kid is like, you do see this. You see your parents naked sometimes and it really sticks to your memory. So later on, while we still lived in that town, my mom um, met a man and they were together for a long time. They're still together. He had a daughter of his own, and in the book I called her Lu, and in the book I called him Amer, which is the exact same name as my mother's, but um, the gender is masculine. So the spelling is almost the same, but that's the only way. I tried to be clear by saying he and she whenever I use either one of their names. Um, somebody had drawn in quarterly, the publisher said something like, the names are unlikely, and they really are, <laughs> to having, having two people named the same, but I just thought that I tried to not be judgmental with my take on the book, but it, that's kind of impossible, and so I tried to just get it out by giving the names that are not like necessarily super flattering. So we, the four of us, moved to Montreal. This is the part where we moved to Montreal. Montreal, or Montréal. It's official. The family is complete. 
Ahmed and Ahmed have already been together for a few years. My mom moves our belongings to Notre Dame de Grasse, where we will live with him and his daughter, Lu. Lu is only with us every other weekend. It doesn't matter. She's my little sister. Don't call me your stepfather. It sounds like half a person. Well, dad, then? I'm not your dad. Um, Polytechnic. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, Polytechnic is uh, an engineering school in Montreal. Unfortunately for the school and for its students, it has started to mean um, something else, which is that there was a school shooting there. What? Um, <laughs> so anyways, there was a school shooting there in Montreal, and it was this type of thing that um, maybe school shootings are more common in other places, but in Montreal and in Canada, Polytechnic is this thing that like even like even though it happened 25, 30 years ago, I mean, it, it happened December 6th, 1989. 1989 um, it's still this thing that everybody remembers, and like everybody remembers what they were doing that day, and everybody like talks about it. I think talks about it every anniversary, and it was just sort of like the reason why I put Polytechnic in my book is just because to me, and I'm not trying to exploit it, and I'm not trying to make it about me, but specifically to me, and it seemed to like seems like to other people around me, it was this um, sort of like the event that made, like, that just made this, made me aware as a child when I was eight that, like, there's insane darkness in the world. It was just this thing that was like, whoa, okay, reality, your childhood is not, like, you know, you've had a good time so far, and then you, you hear about this. And so, also, I wanted to put this in the book because you'll see now, it's good. On the news, they are telling us about a madman who has gone to an engineering school here in Montreal to shoot women, killing 14 of them. The city, the province, the country are in shock. Everyone is mourning. In his suicide note, the shooter claims that feminists have ruined his life. Isn't it crazy? I find it, I find it so terrifying. Mom, what does feminist mean? Anyway, we started to look, lock our door at our doors at home. Even if we're just going to the grocery store on the corner for a second. The other night I got up to pee and Gugu is reading comics at four in the morning. I had a bad dream, she tells me. Come on. I couldn't fall back asleep. I was scared. I dreamt of the shooter. So something else that's kind of confusing here is that I make it um, the mother character is speaking at the third person about the daughter who's right there. And that's just the thing that like, it was a thing part of my childhood, like often like my mom would be talking to somebody else about me and I would be standing right there. And, like, <laughs> and I like, and I, that's the thing that happened. I, I like how I'm like, mom, what does feminist mean? And I get absolutely no answer. Um, later on, we moved to the suburbs where things are jollier and people are more comfortable and you have a yard and you live in a bungalow and um, my mom sent me to camp and I loved it and I was super, I don't know if it was nerdy or geeky or just kind of like aloof, but I was just this kid that was just really into everything, like it just was like camp is the greatest, all of my camp counselors are the coolest people, I want to make friendship bracelets and I want to look like a boy, and I thought my bike was pretty sweet. Um, and then shortly after we moved to the suburbs, but well, this is, this is what it was like in the suburbs. <laughs> Mommy, I am watching a movie on TV in the basement, Ama, his brother, and my mother are in the kitchen. They are drinking red wine and smoking hash. I pretend not to know what they're doing. I don't like it. At school and on TV, we are warned incessantly. People who take drugs can end up in jail. And this is this movie that's, I mean, it, this movie's playing and it says, buy a postcard, 
Bye, Tricker is the name and Chicken's the game. And um, the voice from upstairs is, my daughter, where are you? So yeah, these are all translated from the French, so you gotta take that too into account. MF only does this kind of stuff on weekends to relax. I still wish I was somewhere else. When she drinks, she often needs a friend, so she comes and finds me wanting us to play together. I hide my nose. The wine and hash on her breath smell a little bit like she ate a turd. <laughs> my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. What? Uh, <laughs> look at you. You look like a mummy. I don't know how to go about watching my movie quietly. Whatever I say will make her sad or worse, angry. She wants to wrestle with me, and it gives me the idea to take her on my back to the kitchen where the other adults are. What are you doing? I'm watching a movie. What's the movie? Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveler. <laughs> Let me climb on your back, carry your old ma around. Um, so yeah, I mean, whatever. I, I think th this is kind of more specifically one of the reasons why I wanted to make this book is because I have a lot of friends who are stoners and I have a few friends who are stoners and have kids and I think that for the most part they handle it really well and they have fun and they have a good life and so do their kids but um, the idea that like parents think that their kids don't know that they're high is really hilarious to me and I've had that kind of confrontation with friends before like if you think that your kid doesn't know you smoke weed and doesn't realize that you're different, <laughs> you're really, you're really in denial. I mean, you just if you're gonna smoke weed around your children, you just better deal with the fact that they'll remember it later. Um, and then uh, Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveler. That's I was really glad to just insert this reference into my book because it was a children's movie made by an Australian named Michael Rubble, who actually made some really good adult movies too. I mean, he made some, not adult movies, but that's not what I mean. Um, he made some grown-up, uh, sophisticated, mature documentaries and stuff. And uh, Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveler is so totally my generation. And I've got so many kids collecting stamps in Canada, and I still have a stamp collection because of that movie. And I, he also did another movie called The Peanut Butter Solution, which is like a Canadian classic, I think. And so I wrote him a letter a few years ago and sent him a package of everything I had done up to that point. <laughs> and he was just this guy, and he was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, I do that. Um, I'm wearing this t-shirt, of, I mean this sweater of a TV show that was really, really popular in Quebec at the time, called um, Le Club des 100 Watt the 100 Watts Club, and um, that's also kind of a good way to show how into things I was. Like I had this, I loved being a kid, and I loved watching the kid TV show, and I loved owning the shirt of the kids TV show. Um, uh, throughout my childhood, I didn't know my dad. Um, I mean, I saw him for the last time when I was five and then he just kind of disappeared into thin air but he would he did stay in touch by sending a letter i mean he spoke english so the letter i couldn't read but he would write a letter and um, send me for christmas or my birthday he'd send me some art supplies but they weren't like kids art supplies they were like the real stuff from the art store that like adult, uh, i mean artists actually use and so it was amazing to just kind of be treated that way. That like I was grown up enough to use like the really technical um, ink pens and draw comics with the real stuff, the real equipment. And um, also, I was from a really early age. I was reading so much, and I was reading so many comics, and I loved comics, and I wanted to draw comics when I grow up. So like when I was about eight or nine, I would read comic books that were not meant for children and nobody knew and nobody cared, so. Um, yeah, there's a Tintin book on that drawing, but then Code the magazine that's on the lower right corner was like pretty raunchy. And then <laughs> there's this other, the book that's by my, my um, right knee up there on the left 
left upper corner, that's like Claire Bretéché, who's, um, she just made like depressive comics, but I loved her so much. Um, and then, yeah, I, from this innocent <laughs> state of like being so into being a kid and being anti-drugs and everything, I just kind of, I think I was maybe 11 when I first got like when depression really hit me and also in the suburbs it was really hard to make friends and I say this with the hindsight of knowing that it was hard for my mother too and um, so yeah I just got f fell into a few years of darkness and having trouble um, befriending people at school and stuff and so I gave up on that and just got into drugs <laughs> um, this is my 14th birthday. Um, on the night of my birthday, I have permission to invite four friends, no more, to my house. Five other kids show up and I lose control of the situation. I'm not allowed to use the stereo ever because one time Amar saw me turn off the TV with my big toe when I was <laughs> seven years old. So, I am painting here sort of a... The portrait that I'm painting of my mother's boyfriend is... I was trying to tell a story that, like, everything was not black or white. Like, there were a lot of nuances, because I don't believe in good and evil. I believe that everybody's both. But in the case of this character, he's so... I mean, in the book, but then also, like, in real life, he's just... a certain way, and, like, it's really hard to... It's really hard to relate to what's going on through his brain. For me, it's really hard to relate to like why we couldn't do certain things, like don't eat the strawberry yogurt because it's his, and if he doesn't eat it, he won't be regular. Like, just <laughs> 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 but it was just the type of house we lived in. Like, you know that you can eat all the other yogurts, just don't eat the strawberry ones because that's what he eats. So we, for my 14th birthday party, this is a story of like, I have these people that I barely know over. For once in my life, I have friends at my house. I was not allowed to have guests. And they did this experiment where like they went out of the house for a couple hours and let me have these people around. And um, I was not allowed to use the stereo, like I'm saying. And so this guy's like, this sucks. I'll put on a tape. And I'm like, no, no. No way! It's my mom's boyfriend! I'm not allowed to touch it! What? That's, that's super lame. And then my mom's boyfriend, when he got back, somebody used my stereo, I can tell. I checked the numbers on the counter before we left. <laughs> <laughs> well, between that and the broken chair downstairs, you've just proven that you're not old enough to have friends over. But, I'm sorry! Um, so yeah, I'm very depressed. Once summer starts, I decide to write a letter to my dad in English. Oh my he, he replies, once school starts again. What's up? Uh, sorry. He replies, once school starts again, I decide that I'm not anti-drugs anymore. I'm taken out into the woods with an improvised bong, a glass jar with tubes. I laugh a lot. I have friends now. <laughs> it was, uh, it worked. I am high. It's funny. Oh. Hi. Hey, what's up? Hey, man. Um, so I also, with my um, parents being very open-minded about drugs and how like they can expand the mind and stuff, um, I think my mother was really open-minded about therapy and how it could help me from a really early age. I, uh, I was going to see the school psychologist a lot, and so this is really nice to talk about this right now. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was going to the school psychologist a lot, so you know, you're like in third grade and like you're in class and then someone comes to the door and it's like, is you up there, and then they take you to the psychologist, or the psychologist comes to your classroom to get you so to have your, uh, like, every other week apart appointment to talk about your missing father, because your mom thinks that you need to talk about it. And um, uh, I think maybe that kind of also didn't help with the social situation at school of, like, making me awkward. It's just, like, the kid that the psychologist comes and gets them, like, it, immediately it's just, like, 
why are you seeing the psychologist? <laughs> so yeah, this lady was a therapist that I saw when I was 15. I never went back because she was a freak. Ah! See? Huh? <laughs> when you're angry with a man, you take a hand towel and you do this. You twist it. You bite it. Get it all out. <laughs> At the psychotherapist, I thought I am taught how to get it all out without bothering anyone. So yeah, that's the idea. Let's just go there, twist the towel, <laughs> go rawr, <laughs> and then just continue the rest of your life twisting towels and biting into them. Um, <laughs> this is me as the 15 year old. Yeah. So yeah, I. I was real moody. Um, it, it's right around that age that uh, I was seeing somebody else at a children's hospital and they, um, they recommended that I go visit my father who I had been in touch with over the mail for about less than a year, I think. And then I was sent off on this funny adventure of being this kid from Quebec who doesn't really speak English, like speaks only like punk lyrics, lingu punk lyrics version of English to um, British Columbia. And um, yeah, went on my own for three weeks to stay with my father and his girlfriend. The trip on the ferry takes an hour and a half. Once we, are even once we arrive on Vancouver Island, we have to drive about an hour before we get to Ted Diff and Sabli's house. Sabli is the name that I'm using for my father's girlfriend. The scenery is magnificent. Uh, a bay, hills, a million trees. The road goes deeper and deeper into the woods. They have built their house themselves with materials and pieces recycled from historical houses around the region. The house is in the shadow of giant firs. It always feels slightly cold inside. My father has nailed a blanket to the ceiling to make a wall for me. We wanted to make you a small room. As you can see, this house was built for two people. Haha. <laughs> um, this is the other thing in this part here. Uh, I never really thought much of it at the time, at, at the time, and I'm glad, but it was just like that's the type of open conversations I had to have with my dad where he's just like, this house was built for two people. So basically, like, he and his girlfriend built a house without ever thinking of the fact that maybe I'd reappear someday. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm super weirded out in this drawing here. Um, what have I done? This was a bad idea. And it was. I mean, it was not a bad idea, but it was a huge change. and. Uh, the idea of just even being like this suburban kid that travels super far away to this weird forest man's house and where like the forest man is like, oh, I remember your childhood, I am your father. <laughs> um, the window is broken. <laughs> I remember like going to bed and being really freaked out by the fact that like I had this open hole to the for like this dark forest and just taking off my t-shirt and plugging the window with it. And then I forgot it when I left. Um, this is the house. I guess like the part that's in the left, on the left side, underneath the A-frame roof thing, that's where I was sleeping. Um, this is the front yard. He really lived like, they were surrounded by trees and they, I mean, they were not really off the grid, but they had things like the toilet didn't work and you had to like save dishwater to like eventually pour it down the toilet <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that it would flush and it was this like super idealistic thing actually in the other picture before that you can tell that like the house is unfinished and it's like that was like 11 years after they started building it um yeah just like overgrowth and woods everywhere and then this is the awkward thing of meeting your dad for the first time in 10 years is what do I call him? Papa? Dad? Daddy? Dad Duff? Um, Papa? Yes? Hmm. So I guess, yeah, that would work. This is, um, he was a collector of cars that were broken. <laughs> and <laughs> he just, <laughs> the idea is that you get the same make and year of a car that you have so that you can just 
casually, like whenever something bra breaks on the car that you prefer, you can casually just fix it using parts from the other car. But then you're not that good at fixing cars, so like both cars just become um, <laughs> rusty and dead and have trees growing out of them. <laughs> and also the Pacific Northwest is a great place to connect to collect mold and lichen <laughs> and, and moss. <laughs> and so, you know. Um, the, the amazing thing, and this is like, I'm not going to say that at every presentation, but like, I just feel inspired to share this, is that there's this trailer there about like, there's this trailer there and I remember sitting down with my dad and his girlfriend and them telling me about why they lived that way and, you know, they were just so idealistic, they wanted to live uh, doing what they loved for a living and so they, um, they, had a trailer that they used as a kitchen and then they lived in this canvas stand while the house was being built with like 10 cats and um, by the time I visited them they had 13 but yeah they had like 10 cats roaming around this canvas stand and then it's like super wet Pacific Northwest weather and they lived in the tent canvas tent for two winters and they slept in a futon and my dad described this thing where like one night he um, got out of bed and the bed was really wet and he put his hand down on the mattress and then like when he moved his hand there was a handprint of <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like I don't get it but whatever I mean maybe I'll do that someday too <laughs> um, so yes after all these weird stories like I guess the, this is not, you know, it's not covering all the books. Meeting my father was really beneficial to my growing up. Uh, kind of got me out of this weird rut that I was in. But, um, whatever, anyone can make their own uh, opinion after they read the book. But in the background here, you, there's like a pile of logs and it's basically the beginning, the foundation of a log cabin that my father decided to, decided to build for me um, so that I would have my own room at his, his house but removed from the building so that I could like listen to music late at, at, light, at night and stuff and uh, yeah, if you have a kid, you should do that for them. It was amazing to have that and then I actually eventually moved in there. Um, and then, oh yeah, there were no pictures, so I used pictures for like drawing fairies and cars and stuff, but there's really not much of a collection of photographs of me as a child. And because um, my mother didn't have a camera and then her boyfriend got one and he didn't really feel like taking, I mean, he was not super inspired to take pictures of me. <laughs> and so um, there was only school pictures and so there was no pictures of me from like age zero to like kindergarten. But then when I went to visit my dad for the first time when I was 15, I saw this picture on his mental piece and that's me when I was four. And so I guess my dad took pictures. So it was kind of surreal to like remembering, to remember what it was like to be four, but then to like have the evidence of like, yes, I was a child. Um, and so this is, the, this is the party I had after <laughs> After I finished the book, as you can imagine, I mean, it's sort of like a, an emotional thing to make a book about your life like that, but to do this weird exorcism, and it's also like a totally cliche 30-year-old thing to do, like 30-year-olds are sentimental, and I mean, n not generally maybe, but I just felt like, uh, <laughs> I just felt like, I mean, I think I, it was a Kurt Vonnegut quote or something, but I heard this thing that's like, there's nothing more um, nostalgic than a 30-year-old. And I was like, oh, totally, that's me. And then there's this whole, like, you know, what they call Saturn return thing that's going on, where it's just like, basically, like, to believe in Saturn return sort of involves thinking that you're in the middle of, like, you're the center. <laughs> and so... Um, that's the thing that happened. I kind of became the center again. I had this weird existential crisis where I just needed to like get the demons out or whatever. So anyways, I 
finished the book and was so elated but also too tired to do anything else so I just set up everything on my desk like this <laughs> and I took a picture and um, and now it's the celebration um, I don't know if any of you have questions but please feel free to ask if, um, if I didn't cover everything <laughs> how long did you live in the cat log cabin I lived in the log cabin for seven months and that's a little bit in the book. I just lived out there, and um, the nearest village it was um, an hour and a half walk away. So I just, that's the thing is, I like to say I'm lazy. Like, I just was like, oh, I'm just not going to meet people. And so my dad and his girlfriend would go off to work every morning, and I'd stay there and just draw. Or, like, I'd do the dishes first thing, and then I would draw all night. But yeah, it was good. Still keep a rag to chew on uh, when you get angry? Sorry? Still keep one oh of Oh God, rags. never. <laughs> no, what, you had a question? Um, at what point, at how old were you when you decided, oh, I need to make this, and how long did it take for to start to finish? I am 31 now, and I think that I made the book, I mean, I started working on the book in 2009, but I didn't only do that. And then I just spent like two years, like from um, probably like to 2010 to 2012, I was working pretty hard on that. And uh, and also like before being 28 and starting the book, I had been wanting to do this book for so long, but I was just like, basically all the other books that I did before this are a version of this, except like poetic version of this are like not telling the story completely and like yeah so this is the first time that I did it. Yes. What's your family's reaction been to it? Um, well that's kind of I honestly I'm super nervous because I have not sent the book to my mother but my dad's reaction has been very positive I mean he kind of like is like Ugh, like he feels <laughs> he just like the, his first reaction initially, initially when he got the book in the mail, I mean, I had talked to him and his girlfriend about over the mail about the fact that I was going to do this book. His initial reaction was sending me this like piece of scrap paper that said um, the word "fuck" a lot, but like in this like way that is like holy fucking shit, Geneviève, like holy fuck, like I saw your book and the cover fucking killed me, and it's it was like. Okay, I mean, he just, he didn't mean it in a negative way, but then his reaction after he actually read the book was he kind of calmed down and said, um, he said that he remembers the moments at least that he was there for, he remembers them the same way that I do, and he thinks that I did a good job of it. And he, he also is kind of freaked out by the fact that he did think at the time, they were so young that he thinks at the time that he already knew at the time that it, I'd have probably a bit of a weird childhood, but um, yeah, but like, it's this funny thing of having someone apologize for not being there, and then it starts to feel after a while like, okay, please stop feeling so bad, because now I feel like I have to reassure you for how bad you feel for not being there when I'm the one who <laughs> was, didn't have a dad, you know? <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the reaction. Um, I haven't, and then also the other thing is I haven't seen either one of my parents in years, so. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been a few years with my mom, and then my dad moved away from that amazing piece of property back to the east, to eastern Canada, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? I notice sometimes in the speech bubbles we use the quotation marks. Oh, yeah. Not That's when people are speaking English. Yeah, yeah, that's a little tricky, but um, I guess in the book it's a little, I should have said something. In the book it's a little easier because there's like the first time that that happens, it says in English. Yeah, just want, I just wanted to keep it like separate. So it's in interesting because I did the book in French and then I translated it myself into English. And so the quotation marks are at the same place in both books to say this is in English. But in English, I actually, it's not translated, it's actually what my dad said. And then in, in French, it's like a weird kind of attempt at translating his weird way of speaking. It's like, 
there's lots here and stuff like that. Sometimes there's a lot, there's, I guess, some finesse loss in the translation. Do you think you missed some of what you wanted to say? Oh yeah, I mean, of course, it's impossible to get it, um, to not lose the, I mean, to do it in French was so exciting because I get, the, the thing is, somebody asked me that recently, like, um, the book has more of a sense of place in French than it does in English because I kind of put in these weird colors that are um, these weird colors that are truly from Quebec, like are honestly from Quebec. But then um, in English, it's like it's kind of impossible for me to me be like these people are from Quebec. Can't you tell by the way they talk? <laughs> so yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you for coming, guys. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, if you'd like to buy the book, we have uh, copies available by the register. I'll move all this stuff out of the way so she can uh, sign behind the table. And we love it if you bought the books first before you got them signed. So thank you very much for coming, and um, have a great night.